Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, just please welcome Senator Kalanin Wiakea, English, please. Yorana. Aloha kakayaka. Good morning, everyone. You know, before I get into the, the meat of my, my discussion, I'd like to maybe put out a few Polynesian concepts because I know for our um, Maohi or our, our native peoples, this is very natural, but for our visitors, for people coming from abroad, uh, to understand a little bit of the Polynesian worldview would give you a, a deeper understanding of how we look at living, how we look at life, how we look at life on islands. You know, there's a couple of things. The first is that Polynesians migrated. We moved. And we got around. In fact, you know, we love jet planes today. Uh, back in the day, the, the ancients used um, canoes. And they went around these islands in canoes, as the lay pointed out, in regular intervals. Uh, so it wasn't like, you know, we got in a canoe, we went to another island. Oops, we found a new island and never came back. There was routes that went throughout these islands. Um, people moved consistently. So Polynesians by nature are voyagers. Today, we love the jet plane. That's our modern canoe. I mean, if you ask most Tahitians, they have been, you know, surely to Paris, but also to Los Angeles, to um, Asia, to New Zealand. Uh, our people travel quite a bit. Hawaiians are the same, Cook Islands uh, are the same, uh, Samoans, Tongans, all of the, the Polynesian peoples love to travel. And this is the basis of um, one of our concepts because we look at what we call the Polynesian Triangle, Hawaii at the top, uh, New Zealand uh, on one side, Rapa Nui on the other side, as, uh, and we have what we call outliers, or islands that go all the way to the Solomons, uh, to Micronesia, um, Kapimarangi, Nuku'oro, these are Polynesian outliers. Canoes that uh, were, when exploring, they found other islands, and when they found those islands, they decided to stay on those islands. So, good? Better? Okay. So, our people traveled, and as they traveled, uh, they took with them the, the cultural memory of each, each place, and over time, this memory became the, the background of our, our ancestry, the background of our people. So for us in Hawaii, for example, we talk of a, a very important story, a very modern one, of uh, Te Vahine Ura, uh, who was born in Papino, where a group of us went on uh, this weekend. Um, she was a person here migrated along these islands, and then from what Hawaiians call Pola Pola, or Bora Bora, left on a beach there, and a whole saga of how she ended up in Hawaii, and then became Pele, the, the goddess of fire. So you can see that we have these stories that show how we moved around the Pacific, and how we migrated, and how we colonized different islands. I'm gonna concentrate on the concept of floating islands in the Pacific. Um, taking Hawaii as, as the main example, and you know, for those who are into the sources, uh, there's a book called Hawaiian Mythology that talks about this. And Hawaiian Mythology was um, put together at the turn of the 18th century. And it was uh, taken by uh, American and British um, writers in Hawaii that were fluent in Hawaiian, uh, and they went to the old people and started collecting these stories. So they collected them first in Hawaiian and then translated them into English and later published a book called Hawaiian Mythology. So out of that, uh, we have some distant memories from the old people about what happened in Hawaii, what, how our people came, and stories of Mokulana. Moku means island, motu. In most Pacific islands, that's the same word, motu, moku. Uh, lana is to float. It also means a thought. So when you say mana'olana, that means, you know, a, a thought. So mokulana, floating islands. We, in Hawaii, you know, looking at the literature, and uh, this was something fairly new to me because uh, when we started talking about the concept of floating islands, the question that we had, 
uh, Mark, myself, and others was, is there a precedent in Polynesian thinking of the concept of floating islands? The concept of it. Um, and maybe I, before I go further, let me explain another idea that the Polynesians have. Most Polynesians won't put it in these terms. This is academic terms, you know, but we have, um, the con our concept of time is very different. You know, in the West, when they say before you, we look at the future in the front of us, right? I mean, that's our whole worldview. The future is in the front, the past is in the back. Polynesians are completely opposite. For us, the past is in front of us, and the future is behind us. But you think about it. You know what your past has. You can see what happened in the past. Uh, you don't know what the future holds. You don't know what's coming. So what, what do you do? You look to your past for the answers for what's before you. All Polynesians do this on a very, very deep level. I mean, today, you know, we've been uh, colonized to think that time is uh, the Western view of time. Future's in the front, past is in the back. We march into the future. But really, the way the Polynesians operate is we always look for uh, what's happened in the past. And this is really important. Uh, there's a, a anthropologist, a structural anthropologist, Marshall Solins, that talks about um, mythical realities, you know, and, and he deconstructs this whole concept. It's a very interesting book if you should get it, Mythical Realities. But it talks about this, and it talks about the concept of, um, you know, the first time something happens in the Polynesian experience, it's mythical. The second time it happens, it's reality. Why? Because the first impression, we have no historical record of it. We have no way of looking back in our history and in our past to see how we dealt with this. So the idea of floating islands, take that concept, the concept of time, how Polynesians look at time and the worldview, and then take a look at this idea of mokulana, floating islands. So in the Hawaiian tradition, um, we have a number of named islands. One is called Kane Hunamoku, so the god Kane, Tane, um, one of the four major deities in Polynesia. Um, he hid this particular, Huna means to hide, Kane who hides islands. And this particular island was most often sighted off of the island of Kauai and Hawaii, the northern island. So we're a chain of uh, 140 some odd islands, but the lower, the southern eight are the largest, and seven of those are inhabited. So the northernmost island, Kauai, this mythical land, Kanehunamoku, uh, would appear and disappear, and people would, uh, would be the land of the gods, much like the way in the West, or for the Christian ideal of you know, heaven, of somewhere where you go after you pass. Well, Kanehunamoku was an island where people Polynesians, if they were so lucky to spot this island on the horizon, um, and if they saw it, then they meant that at some point when they passed, they had passage to this particular island. Um, other lands, Kuai Helani. Now, Kuai Helani was uh, most often sighted off of the island of Maui, where I'm from. And Kuai Helani means to hold up, hold up the heavens. Uh, this particular island was the same. It would appear at twilight or at dusk, appear and disappear. It was a place where people wanted to go. It was a place of abundance. Okay, so look at, look at the, tra the traits that these islands have. Abundance, plenty. Um, uh, there is a talk of equality because on these islands, these floating islands, the gods intermingled with the humans and with the animals and with the plants. So the idea of being um, the stratification disappears and people and plants and animals are equal. Other lands, there was one off of the big island of, of Hawaii, the main island of Hawaii, the one with the volcanoes right now. Um, that was called Paliuli. And Paliuli means um, intense Pali. Pali is a cliff. Another name is Paliula, which is a twilight. Same reference to the same island. So basically seen during the twilight times, um, very similar uh, characteristics. 
You want to go there. You want to be there. And there's stories in Hawaiian mythology about people um, being especially <clears throat> um, devout to Kane or Kanaloa and taken in this lifetime to this island. So they'd be in canoes and they'd be uh, taken off track and end up on these particular islands. Other islands, Levanu'u, Levalani, and then one that we would all know, Pola Pola. When you hear the word Pola Pola, what do you think of? The island Bora Bora, here, right? Again, you look at it, the Hawaiians viewed this as something from our past, way in our past. And as we came to the Hawaiian Islands and discovered them, we remembered these islands. The name Hawaii itself is found throughout Polynesia. And in fact, in the Tuamotu Islands, uh, the, there are a number of floating islands, islands that will appear and disappear as well. What are the names? Well, one is Hawaii, Hawaii. Another is Uporu, Upolu, in Samoa, the island of Upolu, but also an old name for uh, Rayatea, right? Upolu. And then, you know, I have to use this one because uh, I, my family is from this particular island. It's called Anna. It's in the, in the uh, Tuamotu Islands, and it's called Hekeua. Ekeua is an island that the Ana people talk about that appears and disappears. Um, they talk about it being sometimes under the water, sometimes above the water, but it appears uh, when uh, someone's about to pass. Sometimes they'll see the island. Uh, the spirit will go to that particular island. Okay, so I've given you a context. Uh, some of the names, some of the ideas, some of the the places and what it embodies. So let's go back to the academic construct of it. If you look at this, right, the idea, the concept of floating islands, the concept of an islands that appear and disappear, what are the characteristics? First, it's somewhere of plenty, somewhere of abundance, somewhere of um, equality, uh, somewhere, someone where, some place where there's great happiness. That's one of the characteristics. So if you look at it again from the other side of the, the coin, we have uh, the concept of the first time something happens is mythological, the second time it happens, it is reality, right? Let's look at this very carefully. The floating islands ideal in the Polynesian worldview is an ancient one, and it's one that we have uh, dealt with for a long, long, long time. In fact, uh, for the Hawaiians, you know, Kahiki is considered a floating island, Tahiti, somewhere far away, somewhere we want to go back to eventually, come back to our homeland. What does this mean for us today? Well, you know, the second part of what I wanted to talk about was implementing ancient Polynesian concepts using modern technology. So you understand that we have this idea this concept in Polynesian thinking. Polynesians also are the most innovative people that you will find. I mean, if you go back again to Lele's talk and later when Tua Pidman uh, talks, you'll, you'll hear about the technological feats of the Polynesians. The idea that they could travel, um, travel the oceans with the technologies that they had, the tools that they, they developed, um, the astronomical observations that we have are absolutely incredible. But the thing to know is that when contact with the West happened, the Polynesians were the very first to quickly adapt. So carving, let's take stone carving or wood carving. As soon as tools, they went from the stone adzes and the, the stone implement, implements, as soon as Western tools came in, they were quick to adapt because they realized that this made their work more efficient and more better. Right? Simple. Polynesians have done this all the time. So you look at it today, I mean, some of the most educated people in the world are Tongan. I mean, there are more doctorates in Tonga, in that little kingdom, than anywhere else on this planet. Some of the smartest people in the world. So, they adapt. We look at the technologies that are being presented here as another 
um, way of adapting. Another way of taking an old concept, you know, we have this concept of floating islands, of islands that appear and disappear, islands of plenty, islands of uh, equality and peace. Um, and we take the technology that you're presenting and make it our own. That's the Polynesian way. We add to it. We, we, we look to our past and say, okay, was there a precedent for this somewhere? Which, in this case, there is. So, I want to lay this before you and put this before you as food for thought, that the Polynesian worldview has incorporated uh, floating islands, uh, that we have um, looked at it as a place of refuge in times of disaster, in times of uh, war, in times of uh, famine, because these were the lands of plenty. So the concepts that you're putting out here today, Randy and others, is exactly that. You're looking for refuge, you're looking for a place uh, to um, have a peaceful society, a place that you can um, look for equality for all. Uh, and I think these are ancient concepts for us. Now, you know, I can, I'm going to put on my, my Polynesian thinking here, switch it from the academic side. You know, one of the questions that I, I've heard a lot out here in, in the community, in, in, you know, in the streets, because you've been on radio, you've been on TV, and as you go through Papayati, people are talking about this. But one of the things I hear is, you know, what's, what is, how does this help us? This is what I hear from the, the people in the streets, the Polynesians. What, you know, can we go live on those islands? Is it going to be there for us? So I think the answer is that, you know, the prototypes that will be developed here will help. And in fact, uh, let's put this, pose this particular question. The area in French Polynesia that would need this the most would be the Tuamotu Islands. Because they are the, the atolls that are quickly, quickly uh, being inundated by sea level rise. They have peaceful lagoons that are protected, deep lagoons. But what do they not have that's needed for your project? Connectivity, internet. So if we had internet in, in the Tuamotus, uh, I think maybe your project would, uh, would work well in those islands. So I wanted to put that concept, that idea out to you, that concept out to you, that uh, you know, this is uh, a Polynesian view. Uh, it's a view that I think many people in these islands will, uh, these islands being all of Polynesia, right, will embrace if presented in these terms. That, uh, you know, the, the prototypes that will be developed here um, will be, will be a tool used in the future for islands as they disappear. And for a number of our countries, Kiribati, Tuvalu, um, for us in the northern Hawaiian Islands, you know, we have atolls that are disappearing as well. Um, we have to take radical action. And this is that radical action, to create new lands, to create the Mokulana, the floating islands that our ancestors saw and to go to them as the final refuge for our people. So as sea level rise takes our lands, we look to innovation and modern technology to create the mythical lands that our ancestors talked about and make that our reality. Thank you.